town, Peco Park, a new beginning, let's go. Started back rocking the brown. Ever since we've been knocking them down. Knocking them down. Baby said she wanna go to the game. To the game. Taught her how to say Padre gang. Started back rocking the brown. Rockin the brown. Ever since we've been knocking them down. Knocking them down. Mitchell and Ness with the old school name. All of the homies holla Padre gang. Yeah. They and good day, everybody. Welcome to episode 160 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. I'm your host, Ben Fadden. Today, we've got a special guest joining me on the show. That is former Padres infielder, Kurt Bavacqua. Kurt, thank you so much for the time. Hey, it's my pleasure. 160, huh? It's yes, a lot that, of episodes. That's right. Yep. Usually do one after every series and try to get on someone uh, every week. And I've had on some former Padres before, Adam Rosales, Clayton Richard. Um, there's one more that I'm blanking on, Tyson Ross. Um, so, and you're now the uh, fourth one. So I'm excited to talk. First off, before we get to some stuff about your career and all that, let's talk about the current team. Uh, before we kind of started recording, you were uh, asked you how your day was, and you said better than the Padres offense. And that offense uh, has scored three runs in the last 30 innings entering tonight's game. What are your overall thoughts on the team right now? I mean, it's being carried by the starting pitching and Taylor Rogers has been really good at the back end of the bullpen. Steven Wilson a little bit as well. Uh, he's had a little bit of struggles as of late, but just overall right now at 19 and 11, what are your impressions so far? Well, I think you just made the point when you said 19 and 11, it's amazing with uh, the offense sputtering the way it has for the really the entire season with the exception of Machado and Hosmer, uh, it's really amazing that they're 19 and 11. And it's all because, like you said, of solid starting pitching. And now they got Clevenger back. Uh, Snell should be back at any time. Uh, you know, they're going to be in good shape uh, pitching wise. And you have to think, that the Cronin Wars of the world and a couple of the other guys are going to pick it up a little bit. The one guy that I'm not too sure about, the jury's still out in my mind, and that's Trent Grisham. I, I just got to wait and see whether or not he's going uh, to be able to put the numbers down that, uh, that he did the first year he was here. And he got all kinds of accolades, won a gold glove. I I never saw it, to be honest with you, but we'll see what happens. I mean, I hope he turns it around. I hope he does. But it seems like opposing pitchers have his number and have had it for the last too many hundreds of at bats. So it's uh it's not a good thing. He needs to make some adjustments. Uh, I'm waiting for people to start pointing the finger at the hitting coaches. Uh, that should be coming any day now. And I'll be curious to see what happens with this club. Do you think it's fair to point the finger at the hitting coaches, I guess, this early in the year? or Because with the Padres, and I know you know this, they've gone through hitting coaches very, very fast, very frequently. A lot of hitting coaches from, you know, when Andy Green was here, Jace Tingler, and now uh, with Bob Melvin, Michael Bedard as the hitting coach. How – is there a certain time where you're like, okay, well, the offense isn't producing. Maybe it's – part of it's not on the players themselves. Well, when you hire a hitting coach that – comes from another thought process and try to combine it with a different thought process, it's not going to work. And, and what I'm speaking of is it's very evident that Major League Baseball has done something to the baseballs this year. Therefore, opening up the option of going back to some old style hitting and they're going to open it up even more next year because they're going to do away with the shift. 
you know, I have seen a couple of guys take an approach this year. Uh, Profar did it the other day. I was happy to see it. And C.J. Abrams did it in the ninth inning of the win the other night when he got the base hit uh, to left field, where you could see that those guys were trying to hit the ball the other way. Mm -hmm. Grisham, it was pointed out on TV last night when he got jammed on a ball and he hit it directly down the third baseline and it was just barely foul. Mm -hmm. And I think Mark Grant pointed out on the telecast that Grisham was trying to hit the ball the other way. I don't think he was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just think the pitch got in on him. Mm -hmm. But as a hitter, and especially a hitter that came from another era, the inside pitch is the easiest ball to hit the other way. You know, they talk about let the ball get deep in hitting zone and you'll hit it the other way. You know, you know that's one way to look at it, but it's really a bunch of hogwash. Uh, most breaking balls are the balls that are on the outer part of the plate. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very difficult to wait on a breaking ball or even to look for a breaking ball that you're going to hit the other way because you've got – you've got too much of an opportunity for the pitcher to pound you inside. So instead of going through a whole hitting clinic here, we'll just, uh, we'll leave it at, I think the hitting coach is too young. I don't know what the mentality is of the players that are, that he's talking to. Uh, I know there's an assistant guy there also. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, the jury's still out on that stuff. We got to see what happens. Unfortunately, when players don't perform, the coaches get the blame. Right. And that's what's going to happen again if if it continues. I don't look for it to continue, at least not at the depths that it's at right now. And, you know, you, you have to say that somebody has done something good with Eric Hosmer. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's really, really doing well now. I mean, his footwork around first base the last game or two is a little suspect. Uh, I still can't figure that out on why he goes into foul territory to get uh, balls that are in the dirt, but he does it. And uh, that's his style of play. And it's something that you just can't uh, flip a switch and all of a sudden – be the kind of guy that stretches out to get the ball because he does do that at times. Yeah. Yeah. But there's an awful lot of times when he sees a low throw, he'll fall back into foul territory. And I think that's what made him a good first baseman and a gold glove first baseman over in the American league with Kansas city, because they have turf and turfs a different type of surface to field on than a dirt field and grass field. Like we have here in San Diego. And I'm not saying that he has to completely change his game, but he's got to think about those two surfaces and know that there's a big difference there. But he's he's a pretty good first baseman. I mean, he really is. He just, at times, you wonder about his footwork. Yeah, and you mentioned the turf and all that, and what I would say to that is it's been four years and now going on five years where, that he's been here, so it feels like he'd have – the time to adjust. I mean, you've played in the major leagues. I haven't. So that's why I, it's great to ask you this um, and, and talk to you about it. And with Hosmer, you talk about his hitting. I like what I'm seeing. I just have seen in the past, he's had hot starts. And then once the season continues, that doesn't continue. Um, with Luke Voigt though, I wanted to ask you about Luke Voigt real quick. He has struck out nine times in a row in El Paso. They sent him back to San Diego to work with some of the coaches, and then now they're sending him back to El Paso. He just seems lost. I've suggested uh, him changing a little bit of his approach with two strikes and going with a toe tap instead of with the big leg kick. You know, Bryce Harper has the toe tap, and he still has the power. Voight, for me, I think he would still have the power with that toe tap. What do you think – what adjustments do you think Voight should make? 
the only adjustment that he can make, I, did I read something the other day where he went three for four in El Paso with two home runs and a double in his first game back there? I don't think he's gotten a hit. Uh, his batting average, uh, I checked. So see, uh, you can never. His batting if average is zero. On, if you see something on social media, you can never believe. It. Yeah, because I'm well. I look every night at the box scores on the El Paso website, and everything is a batting average of zero. That's a, well, that's what I've seen. Well, I tell you what, it, it's getting to a point now where it's concerning because they're going to have to. Uh, they're going to have to look at different things. And one of the things that they have to look at is eyesight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I see a player swing through uh, as many pitches as he does, and some of them hanging, I mean, he's just a dead red hitter. He, he's he's going to hit off a fastball, and that's just the way it is. Uh, if a pitcher throws a breaking ball and it's somewhere around the zone, if it's not up in his zone, he's going to swing and miss it. And I guess that's what's happening down in El Paso also because of the number of consecutive uh, of punch outs that he's had. But the first thing, like with my son, the first thing I tell him if he's swinging through fastballs is, are you picking up the ball soon enough? And you know, I, I have to believe that these are all things uh, that they're going over, going through with Luke Voigt. But, you know, you're right. I think it's a concern. Uh, I think a guy that swings and misses through uh, that many consecutive plate appearances, uh, there's more problem than meets the eye. And it's just him trying to hit home runs and yanking everything. Because you know what? Every dog finds a bone. And when you go up looking for a ball on the inside part of the plate, us hitters give pitchers too much credit. Those guys make mistakes. He's not even hitting the mistakes. Mm -hmm. So that's a bad sign. And until that's corrected, uh, I think the problem is going to persist. Mm -hmm. Now, moving to, I wanted to talk about a little bit about the rules right now, uh, runner on second base with extra innings and the shifts, obviously that not happening next year. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. And then a little bit of the umpiring, you know, with, there's been a lot on Angel Hernandez and that bad Kyle Schwarber uh, game on Sunday night where Schwarber got ejected a couple weeks ago. And Joe West said that the strike zone that's on TV isn't the same as the umpires reports that they get graded on. That doesn't make sense to me. Just, I know it's a general question, but what are your thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts are the same as yours. Uh, it doesn't make sense that the strike zone that you see on TV, because I think they're all the same. Yeah. Um, that it's not the same strike zone that the umpires are graded on. Mm. I, I don't know where that strike zone comes from if it's not the one that we're seeing on television. Uh, it, it bothers me when I see consistency on an umpire's strike zone where the ball is completely out of the square mm -hmm. or rectangular. A couple of times a game, that's going to happen. It, it's, it's not easy. If you watch umpires – and where they sit up behind the catcher. Most of them are either on one side of the plate or the other. There's no middle. They're not right in the middle of the plate where they can see the inside corner and the outside corner. Mm -hmm. So if they're sit up on if they're sat up on the inside part of the plate and a ball's on the outer part of the plate, it's hard for them to, to make that call. Mm -hmm. And that's where you see a lot of misses happening, whether it's a strike and they call it a ball or the opposite. I just don't like seeing an 86 or an 87 percent. Uh, you know, that's where umpires are missing 13, 14 pitches out of 100. Uh, that's too many. Uh, you know, if there's a few, a handful, that's acceptable to me. 
uh, you know, there were guys that Joe, West, you, you talked about Joe West. Um, we all knew going into the game that Joe West was, uh, West was a pitcher's umpire. Mm-hmm. So if a pitcher was consistent throwing pitches on the outer part of the plate, even if the ball was a little bit off the plate and Joe was going to call that ball on that particular night off the plate, we knew we, we better start swinging at it or we're going to get punched out. Mm. You know, you don't see pitches, pitchers, um, unless you watch Kyle Hendricks last night. Right. Uh, I mean, he's, he's a perfect example of a my error type of pitcher. A guy that works the ball in and out, up and down, uh, keeps the hitter off balance. That's what pitching is. They call pitching, they call it nowadays pitching when a guy comes in throwing 96 through 99 Mm -hmm. uh, and striking a guy out. You know, it, it is pitching. It falls into that category. But pitching is a lot more precise than just going throwing fastballs by people. So Angel Hernandez is just a whole other subject. I mean, I think he has his own agenda. Yeah. Uh, he's been a troublemaker for a long time in the league. And again, bringing up Joe West's name. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Joe West took over the reins of the Umpires Association mm-hmm. back about 25 years ago. And from, from that time on, there was peace among the owners, the Umpires Association, and also the Players Association, where they got along really well. Joe West created a really solid Umpires Association for those guys. And I think the strength of what's he what he's created uh, has actually put those guys in a position to do what that umpire did the other night to uh, Madison Bumgarner. Yeah, Dan Bellino. You know he can't get a he can't get away with doing that. Uh, and there 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 can be no slap on the wrist because there's no slap on the wrist for a player or a manager or a coach turning the tide on an umpire and doing the same type of thing. He should get fined. And then they wouldn't pull stuff like that. And umpires that consistently miss so many pitches out of 100 or 10 or 50 or whatever scale that they want to put it on should have to pay consequences on possibly not being home plate umpires. That's, I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my question, or my main – that's a good point that you make because, like, Angel Hernandez, that's been brought up, right? You can allow this guy to umpire if he continues to make these calls like this. And according to Joe West, Angel Hernandez sent him his, like, scorecard or whatever, uh, and it was much better than the public, you know, Twitter scorecard that gets out there uh, on that Phillies game. But if he still continues to blow calls – why does he have to home plate or umpire home plate? Why can't he do the bases? Why, why does every umpire have to do home plate? You know, not, like, do you get what I'm pointing? It's like, there's some, yeah, I get your there's point. some, uh, there's you, some, you know, like, some players called the race card a couple of years ago. Right. Yeah. Uh, and sued the league and lost. Uh, and it, it's not all about that. Sometimes it's about ability. Mm -hmm. And I don't give a hell what your background is. Um, If you can't do the job that somebody else can, whoever their background is, and I don't give a hell who, what their background is. But if one guy's suspiciously better than the other, then the one person has to take a back seat. Mm -hmm. That's all there is to it. I don't care where they come from, but you have to have a means to put people in the same scoring box and the better umpire should be the umpires that umpire behind home plate. Same be said for postseason. Why do these guys have a revolving call 
to get into the postseason. The best umpires in the leagues should be the ones that umpire in the postseason. Mm. Not just somebody that it's his turn and now he's going to umpire. The reason behind that is the strength of the Umpires Association and it's Joe West's fault. I'm not blaming him. I'm just saying he was the one that was ahead of the association and he was the one that created all this stuff. He did a great job. Joe and I are good friends. But there comes a time where if there are 50 umpires in Major League Baseball, and there's a lot more than that, I'm just using it as a number, 100. If there's 100 umpires, they need to have the 30 or 40 best umpires umpire in the postseason. And they need to have the best umpires behind home plate, even if they have to fly them in and rest guys a certain way. I understand standing on third base and umpiring a game is not the same as umpiring a game behind home plate. I mean, we got we see those guys taking a beating every night. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking balls off. I mean, there was one guy. One guy, the Marlins catcher, didn't catch it, and the fastball totally hit him right square in the mask. I know. I, where was that game? What was that game? I was right? against the uh, against the Padres. I think. Okay. Uh, Sunday. I know the catcher. It, it almost looked like the catcher got crossed up. Yeah, Peyton Henry. Yeah, because he 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 looked like he was expecting a ball that was in in his chest area, and it yeah. was up here, and he he didn't make much of a move to get it. Yeah. But that, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about because there are, there is concussion protocol now. Um, you know, umpires have probably had concussions in the past, and just like players have, and they haven't been called on. Uh, it hasn't been called on them because there was no protocol like there should have been. So mm-hmm. I understand that there's things like that that need to be done, but we still need to get the best behind the dish. And we need the best umpires umpiring in the postseason. It's common sense. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Kind of seems like it, doesn't it? <laughs> a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Now let's get to a little bit of your career. My mom's – I wasn't alive, obviously, in 1984. I was negative, like, what would it be, 30 years old or something like that? Um, but – they obviously were big fans of yours, especially in 84 when you hit this home run uh, in game two. And so I'll, be, I'll play it here uh, for this YouTube audience. Give me your thoughts. What were your thoughts as you hit this home run off? Uh, it was Petri, right? Yeah. Petri, yeah. Yep. It, it, well, my thought was I hit it very high. Uh-huh. And I, I wasn't. I wasn't a home run hitter like Alfaro the other day right? where I'm doing this in the, in the dugout, knowing that it's out. I'm, I'm running the home plate and I'm just saying, get up. Right. Well, you can see it as you're you're jogging, you're waiting there. Gone until right now. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So I was three quarters of the way to first base uh, before the ball even come down. And yeah, I would, that was a fun time. I mean, you know, the team came together, the whole town came together. Uh, it was, uh, it was a good time here in San Diego. Naturally it was the first uh, time that the Padres reached the postseason uh, in the history of the franchise. And it, uh, it was certainly fun. Have you had to buy a beer yet since? Oh yeah. I bought plenty of beers. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. Especially growing this thing and going through COVID mm-hmm. with the mask on. Yeah. I can get around town pretty good where I'm not noticed. I can, I can fly through the, through the storm pretty good nowadays. Right. Yeah. Um, I also got to ask you about June 30th, 1982 with Tommy Lasorda, obviously where uh, you called him. Let's see. A, you got. You said you wanted to find that fat little Italian, uh, referring to him because you thought that he told his pitcher to hit Joe Lefevre, uh, Lefay, excuse me, 
uh, after Broderick Perkins homered the at bat before. I wanted to ask, do you regret at all uh, what you said nah. to him there? No? No. Nah. It was just heat of the moment there, and that's what yeah, we thought. It was. Yeah, yeah. It was. I mean, we we went back and forth pretty good. But you know what? I think, and I'm not saying it was that particular incident, but that time frame, and I'm not saying a week before and a week after. I'm talking about around those years. That's when we started to create a pretty good rivalry with the Los Angeles Dodgers, at least from our side and from our point of view. You know, we started to believe that we could compete with those guys. They were always big brother. Mm -hmm. And now, as much as they don't want to talk about it, especially Dodger fans, the Dodgers are starting to recognize that the little brother has grown up a little. And they come in ready to play. They come in excited. Uh, you know, in the last couple of years, even players have said how important the series is and how, how forward that they're looking to play in the series. And I'm talking about guys like Bellinger and, and Justin uh, Turner uh, and guys like that. So, um, you know, I think it's gotten there. Has it gotten to the giant – uh, Dodger rivalry? No. Uh, I mean, it was too many years in the making uh, right. where, where I, we came to New York and uh, came out West. But, you know, I think it's developed into a, a pretty good rivalry. I don't know why they tried to make some kind of a rivalry between the Mariners and the San Diego Padres. I could never figure that out. But That feels more like a joke. I don't know. The spring training facilities and all that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but maybe you're right. It's obvious, though, that like Dodger fans, if you look on Twitter, I mean, my goodness, that's all that they all all they care about is Padre fans, whether it's when they were playing the Padres earlier this year and they're saying you know, it's not a rivalry. That's a they love that phrase, but it doesn't matter. The Padres are without Tatis this series that they played them at Peco this year. That totally looked like a rivalry to me. That looked like a really competitive. I know it's Sunday. Not really, but it was a competitive series. You know, you could tell both teams cared. The Padres were celebrating a lot in the locker room after Nola had that walk-off. Like, they care. And then last year, I mean, you can't tell me that at Dodger Stadium when Tatis was having five home runs in three games that Dodger fans were saying, oh, we don't care. Like, of course they care. You know, so I think it's just a joke, personally, that they're trying to say that it's not a rivalry. Now, in terms of record wise and all that of course the Dodgers own us right now okay the past decade okay because we've had and no disrespect to these guys but we haven't had Tatis playing shortstop the whole decade you know we've had uh Alexi Ramirez in 2016 and you know we had Ryan Shimp playing second base uh Carlos Asuaje so you can't compare that but in terms of right now it's a rivalry well I think I certainly think it is and uh anybody that doesn't uh, is a fool. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's just one of those things where um, whatever, whatever side the fan is on, then they're going to take up for that side. So it's, uh, it's no big deal. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is. all right. With Tommy Lasorda, he did respond to you. And I did want to play the sound for anyone that has never heard it before. Uh, and then get your thoughts, obviously on what he said, uh, and yeah, just the thoughts on what he said. So I'll play it here. This was Tommy after uh, replying to what you said. Tell you what I think about it. I think that is very, very bad for that man to make an accusation like that. That is terrible. I have never, ever, since I've managed, ever told a picture to throw at anybody, nor will I ever. And if I ever did, I certainly wouldn't make him throw at a fucking 130 hitter <laughs> like Lafay or fucking Babakwa who couldn't hit water if he fell out of a fucking boat. And I guarantee fucking to you this, when I pitched and I was going to pitch against a fucking team that had guys on it like 
about Bakwa. I sent a fucking limousine to get the cocksucker to make sure he was in the motherfucking lineup because I kicked that cocksucker's ass any fucking day in a week. <laughs> He's a fucking motherfucking big mouth, I'll tell you that. All right, there we go. So, so do you hear comments, all the laughing in the background? Right, yeah, the media, yeah. See, that exactly. That was the whole thing. That, uh, that audio that you just heard uh, actually took place probably around three weeks after the particular night that okay. you talked about earlier with Neen Fear hitting LaFay. Uh. So it, it was something that was building, and it was Jerry Royce and uh, Jay Johnstone sending this particular media member into Tommy's office. Uh, any chance that they saw that they would get a response like this, mm. which is what they tried to do maybe 10 times leading up to him finally going off mm. and they got the audio. So it was, uh, it was kind of funny. I, you know, I ran into Tommy quite a few times after that. And, you know, the first time was, uh, was interesting because we were at a convention uh, called NADA, the National Auto Dealers Association convention that takes place every year in a, a particular place around the United States. It, this particular year, it was in Vegas. So I was walking through the hall, uh, making an appearance for, uh, for some company, and uh, I took a shortcut to, uh, to get back to the food court area. And when I did, I walked through an area that was cordoned off, kind of, you know, top and bottom. It wasn't just um, a couple of curtains, but it was, it was cordoned off and it was a pretty good sized room. In the middle of that room was Tommy Lasorda sitting at a table with about 10 guys. I walked right into this room, not expecting naturally seeing him. And this was the first time that our paths had crossed after retirement and after uh, naturally that episode. So it was, uh, it was rather comical. I could see the uneasiness of the look on, on Tommy's face and uh, uh -huh. because I didn't shy away. I mean, I walked right over and, uh, and said hello to everybody. And I, uh, I thought that was, uh, that was pretty funny, but yeah, that uh, a lot of people think that video or audio happened that night, and it actually did. All right, yeah, that's good. I I didn't know that. Um, now with those comments, you know, he was talking about at the end there uh, how you were a big mouth. Uh, according to what he was saying there, that felt like he was the bigger mouth in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of f bombs. Well, we all knew. <laughs> We all know and knew that Tommy was a big bag of wind at times. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's why it was so comical. And that's why the, uh, I got such a big kick out of it throughout the years. Uh -huh. And everybody thought we hated one another. You know, I actually called his house and I'm trying, I'm trying to remember why but his wife picked up the phone and his wife's name's Joe. And I said, Joe, I said, uh, may I speak to Tommy, please? And she said, yeah, who is this? I said, it's Kurt Bavakwa calling. And you know how this is pre cell phones. Uh -huh. So it was back when cell phones were either first starting or, but we still had landlines. Everybody had a landline. When somebody cupped, their hand, you can talk to your parents about this. When somebody cupped their hand over the phone, mm -hmm. you could almost tell being on the other line, on the right. other end of the line, that they were doing that. And then the sound came through muffled. And I heard uh, I heard Joe go, what the hell is he doing calling here? <laughs> I thought that was, uh, that was stellar. I love that, that, uh, that she said that. So, and, and the reason is because I know after her saying that, that Tommy brought the whole thing home. 
So he had to, for her to have uh, any opinion on what happened on the field uh, in baseball or anything, unless she was there that night, which she wasn't, Tommy had to bring it home. Mm -hmm. So that that's the part that I, that I got the biggest kick out of. Right. All right. Last question about uh, your career. Well, I have a little bit about uh, Tony Gwynn in a little bit, but in 1984, obviously the big brawl with the Braves, obviously a lot of things are happening now. uh, And as I ask you this, I'll share the screen and uh, show it. A lot of things are happening now in sports with fans, Uh, Chris Paul's family. I don't know if you follow the NBA, but Chris Paul's family, I guess, got pushed or something the other night at the one of the playoff games. And it just feels like to me, like it's so obvious that players should just be allowed to do something or be able to go back at the fan, you know, and have, because the fans, they buy a ticket and they feel like they can do whatever they want. Right. They bought the ticket and this gives me the right to, berate this player or touch someone else's family. Uh, I'm bringing up this here uh, because, correct me if I'm wrong, a fan did throw something at you or you got a fight with a, uh, one of the fans in, uh, during this after this brawl? Well, during there it. were quite a few fans that by the time this happened, uh, and that is in the, I don't know, eighth inning maybe? Yeah. And it took that long. For you tried, you tried hitting him three times, yeah. Oh, yeah, Pat. It, yeah. it took a long time for us to really uh get Pasquale Perez, and he was going to get hit no matter what it took. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it was one of those things where there's a lot of millennials nowadays that uh, you know, call this whole thing off. Like, look at that fan right there, and that one, right? I mean, I tell you what. When fans used to jump on this on the field and two teams were fighting or in an argument, that fan's getting his butt kicked by both sides. It's not just, okay, we're in Atlanta, so they got to be a Braves fan. Mm-hmm. And then Nettles gets hit by Donnie Moore. Yep. So and and Nettles knew it because uh he had yelled back to me when he was in the on deck circle. In the, uh, it, you had to be really careful uh, of your surroundings during that time <laughs> because there was uh, there were a lot of punches being thrown on players that were just running onto the field. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim Flannery got hit a couple of times, but Gerald Perry, and there were, uh, yeah, this is, uh, that's me coming down out of stands. I think that wasn't a real smart move on my part uh, <laughs> to go up into the stands in the eighth inning of a game in a, in a day game in Atlanta, because those boys had been drinking for a while. Uh-huh. And yeah, it was uh plus that dugout is really high and it's, it's not easy to get up on top of that roof. I can't believe I even did that, but I did. So I wouldn't be able to do it now. So they wouldn't have to worry about it. Yeah, but that was fun. You know, baseball, and I'm not talking about fighting. I'm talking mm-hmm. about the way the game is, was played was fun back then. You know, you knew you were going to get taken out if you were a second baseman or a short, shortstop on a double play. You knew as a base runner on second base or third base, either on a base hitter or sacrifice fly, that you were going to have to find your own way to get to the plate because that catcher was going to block it, whether he had the ball or not. Those things don't happen anymore. I mean, we see a replay of Pete Rose bowling over Ray Fossey in a 1970 all-star game over and over and over and over again. Naturally, there were some pretty good collisions between them and the Buster Posey collision, Mm. it took until Buster Posey got his ankle broken for them to completely change the rule. I mean, it's ridiculous, some of the things that are being changed now. I was all for 
them getting rid of the roadblock type play going into second base that we've seen Hal McRae and uh, and George Brett do, uh, even myself at times, flat. Uh, not only went in hard to second base, but he expected a base runner to come in hard at second base. You found ways to get out of the way. Players nowadays, they don't know how to get out of the way, and they would not know how to get out of the way for a couple of years until they worked on it. So, I mean, I, I don't ever see a second base who can come across the bag to get a throw from the left side of the infield. Right. You know, that was one of the first things that we were taught mm -hmm. yeah. as, as second basements. I mean, you either go at the ball and go across the bag and get the ball and, and throw and then turn, or you go to the backside of the bag, or you just take the throw and back up and get out of the way. Now you got guys that are just standing on the base mm -hmm. because they know they can't get hit. And yeah, when I played, hit, when it's it, it's in my mind, it takes something away from the game, and I'm not talking about trying to hurt somebody. I'm just talking about playing the game the way, in my mind, it should be played. Yeah, growing up when I was playing second base, uh, I was taught. Um, my mom went to Cal State Fullerton, won a national championship in '86 with softball. I was taught by her to come across the bag from at second base. And I don't see that like ever now. So yeah, you're right. Um, you had some pretty cool, cool teammates during your career. Um, one of those was Tony Gwynn. I did. Do you have one, do you have one, uh, big memory from Tony that really stands out to you? Mark Grant, uh, did an interview with Chris Rose a couple weeks back talking about how when mud would throw batting practice to him, Tony would, call out the pitch as he saw, you know, the arm slot and stuff. Do you have any cool stories about Tony? You know, I don't have any stories like that because I, I think as, as time goes on, those stories get um, a little bigger, uh -huh. but the, uh, we, we stayed at a, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but um, it was like a little motel type deal where the rooms were around the parking lot area where you where you drive in. It was all one level. And, you know, our rooms were completely around it. And there were players that would sit in their room with their doors open. Just so when somebody walked by, you know, there was there was some reference there. And instead of having your door closed, the, the one thing I remember about Tony, I think as much as anything, uh, isn't about him calling pitches or being the kind of hitter that he is. But anytime I ever walked by his door, he was always looking at video or playing a video game. And I think he was kind of the father of video replay because yep. Yep. Uh, he, he really started it all uh, at least for himself. And it was something that I wasn't interested in. I wasn't interested in playing uh, in playing video games, although I did indulge in Pong a little bit. I think that was the first one ever. Uh, that was kind of fun. But, you know, these guys really got, got into and, and are into video games nowadays. And it's just not something that I was ever interested in. Mm -hmm. But Tony was Tony was a heck of a guy. I mean, he, he liked, you know, we had some guys that were instigators on our team, uh, me being one of them. Uh, I just remember Tony sitting in front of his locker and just laughing. You know, he'd never be one of the guys that was involved uh, in anything that used to go on or a lot of things that used to go on within the clubhouse uh, with Bobby Brown and Champ Summers and Alan Wiggins. Uh, 
but Tony was always over there just watching and laughing. And my fondest memories of, of Tony is, uh, and we hear it all the time was, uh, when you heard that laugh, you knew who, where it came from. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was, uh, the best part, but yeah, I played with a lot of hall of famers. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing the number of Hall of Famers that I was teammates with. So, you know, it was a fun career. It lasted for a long time. And uh, I was happy that I played when I did. Mm. And I was happy. I'm happy to be able to make the comparatives uh, that I do between the game then and what we're seeing now. And hopefully what's starting to go back a little bit to what was then. Right. Hopefully. Yeah, I agree. One of your teammates was Steve Garvey. This is the last one for you. I really appreciate the time. Um, his numbers obviously retired number six and it was retired. What? Four years after the big home run, uh, in the NLCS. Um, my question is, do you think that number should be retired by the Padres? Well, uh, I don't see why not. Okay. I think once you retire a number, whoever made that decision, uh, they made it for a reason. And mm -hmm. the reason is very obvious. Uh, you know, as time goes on, uh, you know, Steve's home run is still probably the biggest home run that's ever been hit in Padre history. Yep. And do you retire a number for one home run? Well, if that's the case, then my number would be retired. <laughs> right. So no, you don't. But, you know, Steve was uh, uh, acquiring him, solidified our team. Uh, uh, it, it put us up another uh, notch on the ladder uh, as far as competing within the division. And, uh, and he was a good teammate. The thing that I can't figure out is it's almost like the Dodgers are not retiring his number because his number is retired here. Yeah. And that's the part that's a little confusing because I think Steve himself will tell you that he, he was just on my podcast uh, about a month ago. And uh, I talked to him for the first time about, uh, not being in the Hall of Fame and uh, what he thought about that and whether or not he expected to uh, to ever get into the Hall of Fame. And uh, I didn't talk to him about his number uh, being retired here in San Diego. Uh, but I did say, uh, why hasn't your number been retired in Los Angeles? And he did not refer to what I just said, where because it's retired in San Diego, I think that's why it's not in LA. But I truly believe that. And uh, his number should be retired in LA too. And I think Steve's, there's a pretty good argument for him being in the Hall of Fame also. Yeah. Uh, I just present that question because I just have a different, I guess, viewpoint on it. And I wanted to ask someone that played with him, you know, that knows him. Um, because I personally, when Musgrove's done, would put 44 over six. I mean, I've said that, but I just wanted to get your perspective on that. And my, my perspective on Garvey is the whole Padre Dodger thing to me. That, that's a big reason for me, I guess. Like, he's known as a Dodger, eight all-star appearances with the Dodgers. And, again, I wasn't alive, uh, so maybe I should ask my parents this and what they thought, uh, what they think. But it just feels like if he is going to be retired somewhere, it's the Dodgers and not the Padres. Well, I think it's a little too late for that. Right, yeah, yeah. It's already retired here in San Diego. But what what did you say about Musgrove over Garvey? The 44. Musgrove's number, the 44, him and Peavy, you combine that, 
uh, over Garvey. I just feel like that is would have, I mean, Musgrove, look, we don't know yet with him. I think, obviously, the future will help determine that if that does happen. But obviously, the no-hitter was huge. If he continues and he's here and signs an extension with the Padres and leads to postseason success and all that, I think they really have a strong case of having 44 retired because of PV and Musgrove when you combine both of those. Because PV was probably the best starting pitcher for the Padres uh, in a long time in terms of just names, right? Uh, for a long time because we've had, you know, Eric Lauer and a bunch of guys like that who have started opening days. I mean, Julius Chassin is another one. Tyson Ross, I've had him on. Just PV was on that different level. You know, he has a Cy Young with the Padres. And then you add in Musgrove with the no-hitter, and right now he's the best starter on the team. And if there's postseason success that comes, I think there's a really strong argument that that number – does get retired when all things are said and done. It's a long way away. I didn't realize that PV won a Cy Young Award here. Yep, 07. I love, the, I the love learning things. He had the pitching triple crown that year. Um, this Having a discussion about some things that people have discussions about in baseball nowadays is ridiculous. That's just a personal opinion. And it, it's talking about Manny Machado being the MVP this year. Uh -huh. I mean, that's so friggin' ridiculous. It's not even funny right now. Mm -hmm. People are talking about, you know, is he doing great? Yeah, he's doing great. He's doing great for three or four weeks. When you're the most valuable player in the league, that's an overall picture of an entire year. And when you retire a player's number, it's an overall picture of an entire career. And for, I love Joe Musgrove. I think he's a great pitcher. But for people to be talking about retiring number 44 because Musgrove and PV shared it, it's ridiculous now. I, I don't see... Would that number be in the discussion to be retired if Joe Musgrove hadn't thrown a no-hitter? I don't know. I, I don't think so. But, again, I I, so. What, I, what I'm saying is with the 44 is I acknowledge that there's a lot of time to go in the future determining on if this happens. Yeah, he's going to have how, to do a on lot. How Musk, on how Musgrove does. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to have to do a whole bunch. I mean, San Diego boy, I love him. You put him in the Padre Hall of Fame for having the first no-hitter? Absolutely. Mm. I'm I'm all for that. But what about Eric Schau? What yeah. about Gene Richards? Yeah. Um, I never hear Gene Richards' name mm. being brought up. And he's still in maybe at the top, if not the top five or so, of quite a few offensive categories for this ball club. In the history of the ball club, I'm not just talking about for one year. Right. I'm talking about an entire career. So I think there's a guy that ought to be down uh, underneath uh, the Western Metals building in the Padre Hall of Fame. And should Eric Shaw be in the Hall of Fame? The Padre Hall of Fame? I don't know. You know, I don't know. Would, would I – would Jake Peavy's name be on my ballot if I was voting for the Padres Hall of Fame? I don't think so. Now, with Joe Musgrove, yeah, because he got the first of something that had never happened before in the history of the franchise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to your point, Gene Richards, I'm just looking it up right now. He is 10th all-time in Padres war at 19 wins. In front of Caminetti, Headley, uh, Nevin, Nate Colbert, Brian Giles, Terry Kennedy, Eric Shaw is at sixteen point four. He was yeah, he was a really really good player. Yeah, he was a good player. Yeah. All right, yep, this has been fun. Nice. This episode is sponsored by Gaglion Bros Famous Cheese Steaks and Garlic Fries, located inside Petco Park, located in Mission Gorge, Point Loma. 
You can visit gaglionbros.com to view their entire menu. This has been episode 160 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show, Ben Fadden with Kurt Bavakwa. Kurt, thank you so much for the time. You're more than welcome. Thanks for the invitation.